You've probably seen ponds like this in a park or in the countryside not far from your home. Perhaps, like this group of students and their teacher, you've gone out to study some of the life in the pond. Let's go along with this group and find out more about this pond. We'll find that the pond is the home of a self-sustaining group of plants and animals. These plants and animals share the same surroundings from which they obtain the necessary things for living. The most plentiful of the living things are green plants. We can recognize three different types simply by observing where they grow. Growing near the shore are shoreward plants. Their leaves are above the water and their roots are in the bottom of the pond. Close by are plants on the surface of the water, floating plants. Beneath the floating plants are those that live under the water. These are the submerged plants. Without green plants, the pond could not support animal life. For green plants are the basic food supply for large and small pond animals. What are some of the smallest animals in the pond? Can we see them in the pond water? Let's find out. An ordinary glass jar is a good container for collecting small specimens. And a hand lens will help us to discover some of the tiny plants and animals. This is a hydra, one of the common pond animals. The hydra is about a quarter of an inch long. The water flea is about the same length. Great numbers of water fleas are the food of fish and other animals. Water fleas, in turn, eat tinier animals, animals so small that we can see them only with a microscope. Microscopic plants and animals of many different kinds are the basic food supply for pond animals. As we look over the pond, we can see larger animals. For instance, these insects. These are small beetles, and as we watch them darting and whirling about, we can understand why they are called whirligig beetles. They usually stay on top of the water, on the surface film. But they also travel on the underside of the surface film. Here, just beneath the surface film, are some snails. These common animals eat green plants. In turn, snails are a favorite food of fish and other larger pond animals. Under the water, too, we'll find different kinds of insect larvae. These are mosquito larvae, suspended from the surface film. Mosquito larvae breathe air, which they get by poking their breathing tubes up through the surface film. Do you see how we can kill mosquito larvae by spraying oil on the water? A film of oil keeps them from getting air. Mosquito larvae are not rapid swimmers, so they are an easy prey for larger animals that live under the water, such as dragonfly nymphs. Watch the dragonfly nymph. A good catch. We can see the small mosquito larva inside the mouth of the dragonfly. Dragonfly nymphs feed only on other small animals. They are able to catch live prey with the help of the lower lip, which can be extended like a small scoop. The dragonfly nymph is one of the most ferocious of the many different insects we'll find in a pond. This one doesn't hesitate to attack a small fish. Here's an example of both the struggle to get food and the struggle to avoid being eaten. The dragonfly is one of the many insects that spends part of its life cycle underwater. After about a year of underwater life, wings begin to develop and the nymph climbs up out of the water to enter the adult stage of insect life. 
If we watch carefully, we'll see the successive stages as the dragonfly comes out of the nymph's case. Now the dragonfly is completely out of the nymph case. After a while, the four wings open and stiffen, and the dragonfly takes to the air. We'll see these flashing, darting insects skimming over the pond in the bright sunlight. For adult dragonflies, the pond is still a source of food where they may catch and eat adult mosquitoes that emerge from the water. And the water is also the place where the female dragonfly lays her eggs, starting the life cycle all over again. The life cycle of many pond insects follows the pattern of the dragonfly. This is the nymph of the mayfly. Like dragonflies, Mayflies spend part of their life cycle underwater. If we dredge along the shore of the pond with a dip net, we may bring up nymphs of the mayfly or dragonfly. These nymphs, about an inch long, are those of the mayfly. What other kinds of underwater animals might we bring up in our net? Here is a tadpole, a large diving beetle, and a minnow. This diving beetle is one of the biggest of the pond insects. It's easy to see why it is called a diving beetle. Here along the bottom of the pond are tadpoles. If we observe them over a period of time during the summer, we'll see some interesting changes. This young tadpole has a long tail. After a few weeks, two rear legs develop. Still later, the tadpole has four legs. And finally, he comes out of the water as a full-grown frog. What does the frog find to eat? Sitting on a floating leaf in the pond, the frog watches for insects. Here's a mayfly. Insects such as mayflies and mosquitoes are food for the frog. Sometimes insects such as the mayfly fall on the surface of the pond. Beneath the surface are large and small fish that may react to a mayfly like this. Of course, minnows and other small fish are a source of food for the larger fish. And so the problem of getting food is an important part of life in a pond. In studying this life, we've seen certain food relationships among some of the common animals that live in different parts of the pond. There are many more plants and animals in the pond that we can observe and study, and many more examples of relationships between the plants and animals that share the pond. We too sometimes share in these plant and animal relationships. Some of the larger fish, for instance, are food for us. the abundance and variety of living things, the changes in their development, and the food relationships among different forms of life. These are ideas we can better understand by our study of life in a pond.